my dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we celebrated the Monday Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Thursday, Saturday, and the Easter. And we are now in the week of God's mercy. And we are celebrating the Feast of God's mercy too. So I'm here to give a message on God's mercy because I'm a missionary of mercy. Many people are asking for such messages. Close your eyes for a moment to listen to God's word. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for the listeners of this video. I'm going to speak about your mercy, your abundant mercy, your compassion, and your love. Help me to speak what you want me to speak. Send your Holy Spirit upon me. Also, send your Holy Spirit upon all hearers, so that they may open their hearts to your mercy and experience your mercy in their lives, and they may show mercy to others as you want them to do. Mary, Mama, Good Mother, Compassionate Mother, Mother of Sorrows, pray for us. You begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes, ever since I became a missionary of mercy, in the year 2016 by Pope Francis, I think, meditate a lot about God's mercy. Sometimes I think we are giving more importance to God's mercy than the, than the, 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 the highest quality of God or qualification of God, that God is love. Yes, as I told, when I go deep into the mystery of God's mercy, I see God's mercy is only one part of God's love. God's love is most important. And that is the greatest qualification or quality of God. God is love. We know who spoke about it. The one who was leaning on the chest, on the heart of Jesus. We read in John chapter 13, verse 23, that is St. John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. It is he who proclaimed to the world, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. We know none of the other evangelists or any other writers of uh, the whole Bible ever said God is love except John. It's because he experienced that love. Although he was walking along with the other disciples, 11 disciples, he had a special place in the heart of Jesus. That's why at last supper, he was leaning on his heart. And later he had the opportunity to see the broken heart of Jesus at the foot of the cross, which nobody else, no other disciple uh, was able to witness, able to see. That's why he proclaimed the world. It was a compelling force in him to proclaim God is love. Many people ask me why God came to this world. We have many answers. He came to forgive our sins. He came to give us salvation. He gave to open the, uh, he came to, uh, came down to open the gates of heaven for us. Many things. But when I meditate deeply, why God sent his son Jesus to this world? Or why God became man? I think it is to love. To love us. To love the world. That's why we read in John chapter 3, 16. God so loved the world 
that he sent his only begotten son. So it was a manifestation of God's great love. So God came to love us in the form of a man, Jesus. That's why we read in 1 John chapter, in 1 John chapter 4 verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as expiation for our sins. So God loves us. Everybody knows that. I say he's thirsting for our love. The other day, on Good Friday, I'm sure, when you heard the Passion reading, you heard on the cross, Jesus cried and said, I thirst. We can see him during his life thirsting at the well of Jacob, where the Samaritan woman came to draw water. He was actually thirsting for souls. He came to this world thirsting for souls because he knew the thirst of a man for God. Man also in the heart of heart is thirsting for the love of God. That's where we have Psalms 43, 63 saying, I like the deer running for the uh, running waters, my heart is Thirsting for you, O oh God, my God. So there's a thirst. I say when God's love, God's thirst for love, meet man's thirst for love, there is salvation. Hallelujah. Now, I'm coming to the point when I meditate more and more of this love, I see it is like a coin. A coin has two sides. So we cannot explain one without the other or both go together. God's love has two sides or two dimensions, I could say. One is his mercy and second is his grace. This is what I want to explain more in this talk to you. Because ever since I became a missionary of mercy, I heard many talks of many prominent people and many explain saying God's mercy and God's love are the same. I was thinking, perhaps when you analyze, there is a similarity, a great similarity, but I would not say same. And some people said, yeah, God's forgiveness and mercy are the same. I would say, mm, not fully. So, Holy Spirit was revealing things to me. Now, if you look at the creation, you can see God was creating the whole world out of his love. Actually, it was a sharing of love, especially the creation of man in his own image and likeness. And when he was in paradise, uh, in the Garden of Eden, uh, we know he was totally in grace. He was in communion with the God, fellowship with the God. God was coming and walking with them. And we can see they had no worries, no anxieties, no weaknesses, no infirmities, no sickness. So they were so happy so joyful, the result of God's love coming as a grace. They were in grace. They were not in order of mercy that time. So we see the pure form of human life in grace in paradise, as explained in the first pages of the Holy Bible. And then we see man lost that communion with God. That love of God, that grace of God, and fallen away from God's love. And then he was in need of God's mercy. 
Hallelujah. So that's why many what you call fathers of the church uh, or theologians say, Felis culpa, say happy sin. <laughs> that means if this sin had not happened, perhaps Jesus should not have been born on this earth. So it is because of the sin of Adam and Eve, the first sin, uh, uh, God had to send to send his only begotten son for our salvation out of his great mercy. So we begin to see God's mercy at the very beginning, beginning of creation. And then in the pages as we go, we see man committed sin, God punished serpent, man, woman, and the earth, we see, and then put man out of paradise so that he might not reach up to the tree of life. We should know in the garden of Eden, there were two trees, tree of the knowledge of good and evil from where they plucked and ate, which they were told not to pluck. And another tree, tree of life, that we know is Jesus Christ the Lord, who has to be lifted up later on the tree, the cross. We see there, God did not allow them to pluck from the tree of life, put a guard, put a fencing, and put Kerubin to look after the tree of life, so that man might not touch. There we see God's mercy. Sometimes some people might think, why God did not allow them to pluck the fruit from the tree of life? It was not because of God's anger. It's because of his great mercy. If man had plucked from the tree of life with all his defects of sin, he would have remained in defect forever unto generations. There would have been no possibility of redemption or salvation. That's why God put a fencing around that tree and didn't allow man to pluck from that tree. You must understand that. His great love expressed in mercy. You know, already God had promised uh, that uh, uh, as his uh, son would be sent for redemption. We read that in Genesis 3.15. That had to be fulfilled. Again, we see the first pages of the Bible, the mercy of God. That is, we see Cain. Cain killed Abel. He should have been punished very much. Actually, he was punished. Then he pleaded with God. God have mercy on me. Uh, if I go around like this, like a vagabond, people will throw stones and kill. So God put a mark on his forehead forehead and said, uh, all those who stone or do any harm to Cain will be cursed. She God's love expressed as mercy. Just uh, before that also we see man, uh, you know, after committing sin, became naked, felt ashamed, and he made a cloth with the fig leaves. And we see God killing a lamb, an animal, took the skin and gave a leather leather dress cause love to mercy in all this we see one aspect perhaps we are not seeing god giving life yes adam and eve as a result of sin would have died but because of the leather skin he lived and again, we see uh, people that stoned and killed Cain, but God allowed him to continue living, gift of life. That is what we call grace. So we see in God's love, these two dimensions. One is mercy, another is grace. And we see in the time of Noah, People committed sin, as we read in uh, Genesis chapter 6. And you know, what was the decision? What was the mind of God when he saw even every thought of man was corrupt 
was in sin. Uh, he actually decided to exterminate humanity. We see he regretted that he made man on the earth. His heart was grieved. And I'm sorry I made them. And verse six, chapter 6, verse 7, the Lord God said, I will wipe out from the earth the men whom I have created. Not only men, but also the beast and the creeping things and the birds of the air. I'm sorry I made them. Oh, God was determined not only to exterminate man, but all the animals, all the birds, all the fish, everything, because everything was created for man. But God shows his merciful love. He spared the family of Noah. And we see that is God's mercy. He did not wipe out the man on earth. And then what happened? Through Noah, uh, humanity continued. That is life-giving love we call grace. That's all throughout the Bible. We can see from the beginning till the end, we can see God's love coming to man in the two ways, mercy and grace. We can see later Abraham's sacrifice. Abraham loved God so much. In his old age, he got a child by name Isaac. A fine morning, God is telling to take Isaac and to sacrifice Isaac. It was so hard. And, and what he did, he took Isaac, some wood, some fire, everything ready for a sacrifice. He didn't tell his wife, Sarah, how he told, but us, Sarah would have taken the child away. And that case would not have been fulfilling the promise she made to God. God asked and he agreed, I would sacrifice my son. That was his faith. That was his love for God. You know? We see Abraham as the father of faith, also father of love, love of God. Love of God is by keeping the commandments. What Adam and Eve did not do was to keep the commandment. He failed. That was sin. And here Abraham wanted to obey God fully. Uh, Jesus later said, you remember in John chapter 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Abraham loved God so much. So he was ready to spare his only son. You must remember, old man, in his old age, got a miraculous child. There's no chance for another child. Taking him to sacrifice on um, Mount Moriah. See his heart. And taking, and on the way the child asked, Isaac asked, Father, you have the knife, you have the fire, and you have the wood. Where is the victim for sacrifice. You must know the victim himself speaking. You know what he said? God would provide. Had he said, no, you are the victim, but the boy would have run away. In that case, uh, the sacrifice would not take place. So 100% Abraham wanted to do that sacrifice. No compromise on that. He went to the hill, the mountain, made, prepared the altar with the wood and tied the son and put him on the wood and he took the knife. We know then the angel of the Lord by the command of God said, no, don't touch your son. God's mercy. And then there was a lamp in the bush God showed and he took and sacrificed the lamp. Yes, now let us define God's mercy. God's mercy is preventing or withholding what we deserve. And God's grace, life, is giving us something we don't deserve. Adam and Eve did not deserve life, but God gave. He covered his sin with a leather, leather dress. And we see uh, Cain did not deserve to live. He should have been dead. 
but God gave a mark that he would not be stoned. So he deserved to die, but God prevented it with, with her withholding the punishment and comes to Noah's time. Same thing. Mankind by sin deserved to die, to be wiped out from earth, but God withholding it, preventing it, cancelling it, mercy, and giving life to Noah and family, continuing the humanity, his grace. Again, see Abraham, very clear, that Isaac deserved to die in a sacrifice that is fully determined by the Father because commanded by God. And our God himself now withholding that sacrifice, saying, don't touch your son, put down the knife. Yes, and then sacrifice is done. That is giving a lamb, which he did not deserve. Abraham did not deserve. So gave a lamb. So sacrifice was done. The command was done. The command was what you call observed. So he was able to love God with all his heart and mind. And if you go on saying, as you can see in the Old Testament, Joseph, he was deserved to die in the well where the brothers pushed down. And God prevented his death. And uh, to the medians, the people who are going for business, he was lifted up from the well. And he lived and he became the governor of Egypt. See, God's grace and God's mercy. Mercy prevented what one deserved or one deserves. And mercy, the grace gives what he doesn't deserve. This is the difference of uh, what you call two dimensions of God's uh, love. And then again, see, uh, actually when Abra uh, Moses came down from the mountain, Mount Sinai, they were worshipping the idols. And they deserve actually to die. But Moses pleaded and spared them from the punishment. God's grace we see again. And look at David the king. He was of God's heart, a man so innocent, so wonderful, spirit-filled. He lost everything by his uh, mortal sin of committing adultery, murder, etc. And he deserved actually death. But God allowed in his family the only son Jesus to be born. Jesus was born of the family of David. Grace coming. And the life of Jesus we see. Uh, he was telling the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, actually, uh, the prodigal son deserved to be hungry and poor in the pigsty. Because he himself uh, squandered his money, wasted his money on women, alcohol and friends. So he deserved to suffer that. You know, sometimes when people lose all what they have by their licentious life, we sometimes say he deserves that. <laughs> Actually, he deserved to be in the pigsty. But the moment he decided to return to his father, the father went down. He said, Papa, I'm not deserved to be called your son. Uh, count me among one of the hired servants. But God forgave mercy accepted him as his son. And then what he did? Put a new cloth, new sandal, new ring, made a big banquet. Uh, that is his uh, grace. So we can see very clearly in the parable of the prodigal son, uh, mercy and grace. And then we can see, go on, we can see uh, what he call St. Paul the Apostle. Hmm? Uh, he was against Christ, Christianity. He wanted to exterminate Christianity, wipe out Christianity. I don't go to explain that. We know that. And then God appeared to him. The Russian Lord appeared to him on the way to Damascus and asked the soul, soul, why you persecute me? 
and he was converted. He changed his heart. He repented, I'm sure. Three days he was uh, blind. And then only Ananias came and prayed over him for the Holy Spirit. So we see God's mercy in forgiving Paul and his grace making him an apostle. Uh, only 12 apostles who were with the Christ were called really apostles, but a uh, later apostle, Paul, because he saw the risen Lord. See, this is God's mercy. Now what I say, if you look into our life, you can see, by sin, we deserve punishment, condemnation, hell. But God, in his mercy, cancel the punishment. I say, withhold the punishment. That is his mercy. But that's not enough for one to live. He needs grace. That is, we receive in confession, in other sacraments, grace to live. This is, in a way, the paradox of God. The paradox of love, I say. And Jesus says, Jesus commands and say, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We know Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. And, uh, and you know, he explained a beautiful uh, parable, parable of the Good Samaritan. We know uh, the man was caught by the robbers. He was robbed, wounded on the way to Damascus. And there we see, um, on the way to Jericho, I'm sorry. And there, a priest, Levite, passed by without even looking at the man who was wounded. But a Samaritan, mind you, Samaritans and Jews were the historical enemies. You know, Jews used to consider Samaritans as bastards. That's where the well of Jacob, when Jesus asked for a glass of water at the well, the lady was uh, surprised, shocked. You being a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan, a glass of water? It cannot be. It cannot be. So such an enmity they had. We know Jesus came to break all barriers. So also we see this Samaritan man seeing this Jew on the way should not have looked at him according to the law of the Jews. The law of the Jew was uh, teeth for teeth, uh, eye for eye, retaliation. But here we see in this man something great. He got down from the animal, the horse, and bent down, washed his wounds, put oil and wine and bandaged. That is his mercy. Then what did he do? He took the man on the shoulder and then on the back of the animal, took him to an inn and paid the expense and told the innkeeper, if not enough, when I come back, I'll pay the rest. Oh, that is his grace. And after saying the parable, what did Jesus say at the end of the parable? Luke chapter 10, verse 29 onwards, you read that parable. He said, go and do likewise. That's why Jesus said, me merciful as the heavenly father is merciful. Luke chapter 6, 36. If you are experiencing God's love as mercy and grace, we are expected to do the same in our life. So we must know that loving God has another side. We know loving the neighbor. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul. We read in Mark chapter uh, uh, 12, 29. And love others as you love yourself. Of course, Jesus made a little correction. Uh, love others as I have loved you. He corrected that at the Last Supper, we know. John chapter 13, 35. Because he saw many people not loving themselves. He showed there are many suicide happening in the world today. Yes. That's why he corrected and said, love others as I have loved you. 
the model of loving others is Jesus himself. He loved us uh, by giving even the last two drop of fish blood. That's why in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, St. Paul telling the married couples, love as Jesus loved the church. Yes, church means the people of God as he loved us. Even shedding the last drop of the blood, a husband or wife should love each other. So also in Christian life, loving, the model of loving is Jesus himself. So this paradox is to be put into practice in our life. It is sometimes difficult. We say difficult. You know, Jesus said very, very clearly, mm -hmm. uh, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. One of the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, we read that. So, we are no escape from this command. You know, when Jesus says about love, we must turn our attention acting to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 44 onwards. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your heavenly father. For he makes his son rise on the bad and the good, causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. If you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same. So be perfect as the heavenly father is perfect. You know, we Christians are called to be perfect as the heavenly father is perfect. We are called to be holy as God is holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Often we bewilder or we perplex at these two commands. How can I be perfect as God is perfect? How can I love as God loves? Or how can I be holy as God is holy? Impossible. We must know here, my dear brothers and sisters, Mother Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, who was born immaculate without any sin, had the same crisis when the word of God came to her. You are going to be a mother. You will conceive a child. She said, how can it be? I don't know, man. I never had a contact with a man. You know, she found it impossible because she was a consecrated virgin. She must have been praying. Uh, to God, to keep her virginity and consecration. Then comes uh, a message that is contrary to her plan and desire. You will be a mother. That's why she said, how can it be? It cannot be. Humanly, it cannot be. And then the Lord said to the angel, Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And the one whom you conceive, you must call Jesus. And his kingdom will have no end when don't speaking. And then the angel says, there is nothing impossible with God. Luke chapter 137. My dear brothers and sisters, keep that in mind. Everything is possible by the Holy Spirit. It is that Holy Spirit that you have in your heart by your baptism, confirmation and other sacraments and your life in the church. Don't forget that. You, I'm speaking, I think, to the Christians uh, to have the Holy Spirit in their life. You must know the greatness, the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, from now on, verse, we are preparing for Pentecost. And the preparation means knowing more and more the mystery of the Holy Spirit in us. There's nothing impossible with God. And like that, we sometimes think it is uh, impossible impossible to be holy as God is holy, perfect as the 
as God is perfect, to show mercy and grace to others, showering grace to others. Uh, we must be like that good Samaritan, not only winding up the wounds, but maintaining his life. Yeah, it must go together. It must go together. And we know Jesus gave the parable of the servant, the fun forgiving servant. We know a master to whom a servant owed a big sum of debt. He fell down at his feet and asked for pardon. And he, uh, uh, the master gave forgiveness. On his way, he found one of his small servant with a small debt. He also asked pardon, but he did not. He throttled him and put him in the prison, punished him. And uh, other servants reported to the master. We know that story. And then the master called a servant and was angry. Uh, should you not have forgiven as I have forgiven you? Mm -hmm. You should have shown the same pity to your servant. And he did not show. So what happened? He was bound and kept in the prison. It is in that context that we read Luke chapter 636. Uh, the parable is uh, in Matthew chapter 5. And we see uh, uh, we, uh, what you call, so will not the heavenly father do to you unless each of you forgive his brother from heart. Matthew 5.35. Yes, the teachings of Jesus. All throughout the Bible, we can see teaching is this paradox. For example, forgive, you will be forgiven. Matthew chapter 6, for 50, for 14 and 15. Bless those who curse you. Bless are not what you call persecuting them, not cursing them. Pray for those who, uh, what you call, mistreat you. Do good to those who hate you. Oh. No revenge. I just want to read one passage from Romans, chapter 6, chapter 12, sorry. Romans, chapter 12, verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his heart. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with the good. Hallelujah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Meditate on that. You know, once I was giving a retreat long ago, maybe 20 years ago in Germany, a place called Kavarar. I think it was a retreat for 500 married couples. And I found it strange with one couple. Always, during the talk, during the eating, uh, each other putting the hand on the shoulder, more several times <laughs> hugging. I found it abnormal, especially I come from India. There is no much kiss and show in India. <laughs> you know that. And all others were not doing that. Only these married couples, they were looking about uh, 45, 40, 50. Uh, so much love, always holding the hand, putting the hand on the shoulder. Uh, and peeling the banana and giving half, uh, like that, so many gestures of love. Second day, they came to me for counseling. I said, I'm very happy to see you loving each other so much. And then you know what the man said? Yes, I'm obliged to love her so much. I asked why. I know every married couple should say that, why you are particular to say that. He said, you know, I married her, lived together seven months, and then she became pregnant. I was suspicious of the pregnancy. I thought it not mine. I divorced her. She pleaded, saying that it's not anybody else, it is yours. But I couldn't. Okay. She wept, cried, but I did not forgive her. And I went away. Several times she called, but I did not reply. Wrote letter, I did not reply. Officially from the court, I got 
divorce. And I fell ill in my kidney. I needed a new kidney because my creatine went up to seven. Doctor said I needed a kidney. None of my relatives wanted to give a kidney. It is then I put on a publicity in the newspaper and the television. And every day, the doctor in the hospital was telling nobody came forward with the kidney. Sorry, no operation, no operation. I was praying, expecting somebody to give a kidney. How much money? I was ready to pay any amount of money for a kidney. And one day, the nurses came and prepared for the operation, prepared me with the dress and took me to operation theater. I, with a surprise, asked, who is giving me kidney? How much you have to pay? And with a smile, the nurse said, no payment. Who is that generous person giving a kidney free to me? That it is your ex-wife. You can imagine the feeling, the emotion he felt. He just wept, asked, is it Elizabeth? Yes. I want to see her now before the operation. No, you cannot see. She is on the operation theater. You will be besides, you will be in two rooms, simultaneously, same time operation, taking her kidney and putting on you. And said, Father James, if I had not received her kidney, I would not have been alive. After my operation, I met her, gave pardon, forgave her, and said, we will go together to the court to annul the divorce. You know, there are many people in the Catholic Church wave, waiting for the annulment of their marriage to get married with somebody else. But here we see a man who wants to annul the divorce. A couple want to annul the divorce. It is happening. In my British, uh, I have, I think, some record of uh, 60 or 58 people who annulled their divorce in the court officially came together to live. Yes, this is what should happen in a Christian life. You who hear me must look into your heart. Brother, you have forgiven others. Yes, remember the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, 14, 15. If you do not forgive others, I will not forgive you. And if you forgive others, I will forgive you. I'm sure many of you made confession for Easter, received Holy Communion. But ask ourselves, are you really, really Lord Jesus in your heart? Was it a good confession? Perhaps you made a repetition of all the sins you usually make in every confession. Are some people to whom you felt anger, hatred is still in your soul. Maybe towards some people who died, or some still alive, maybe your ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, ex-husband, ex-wife, or your own father, anybody, maybe a priest, maybe a bishop, or one who deprived you of something. Have you forgiven? Have you shown mercy to that person? Not only really showing mercy, continue loving. As this couple said, Father James, it is my duty, Father, to take care of her till the end of her, till, till her last breath in a particular way. I feel an urge for me to give that love. I'm giving my life to her. Although at the wedding, I shed it at the altar before the priest. It was fake, Father. Now I'm doing it at every minute. Every minute I'm giving myself. Not only for forgiven, giving life. This is what the meaning of what we heard from Romans chapter 12, verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Yes, when she gave the kidney, or when the news of her giving kidney reached the man, it was like a burning coal on his head. Conversion. That's why Jesus said, do good to those who hate you. Love your enemies. 
if you examine our conscience, but as we may see, we love many people. Who? Those who love us. We love many those who love us. And second, we have to ask ourselves, how many people who do not love, we love? How many, perhaps maybe very, very few, loving those who do not love fears? And third degree, do you love any of your enemies? Enemy means one who did harm to your life or to your family. But as when we examine, maybe not found. That's why Jesus said, unless your righteousness uh, uh, excess go far beyond the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not go to heaven, enter the heaven. Uh, so let's look into ourselves, how we show God's love as mercy and grace to others. I remember In 1993, I was kidnapped. I'm sure some of you have heard of that story. And afterwards, after six months, they could not find any culprit. So they thought uh, everywhere news was spread. It was a fake story. I made up the story. I said, I let you go. I don't go detail. I into the detail of the kidnap. Once when I was conducting a program in the retreat house, which I founded, the retreat house in Kerala, India, called Kairish Bhavan in Kottayam. One young man came and told me, Father, forgive me. I said, why? You did not do any harm to me. Why you ask me pardon? Father, I, the, I am the betrayer. I gave all the details of your journey, your travel, and your, uh, I told uh, how they can catch you on the way in the train. I'm sorry when I came to know that you were kidnapped, persecuted, kept in a toilet, shut up for five days without food and drink, and you came out with many wounds on your body. And when the news was reaching, I felt so sorry. I was ashamed to come here to ask pardon. Then yesterday, my nine-year-old son told me, Papa, Go and ask pardon to Father James. Why? Because my mother died with a snake bite. Now my wife is in the hospital with a snake bite. Father, how do you cursed me? I said, I never cursed anyone. I know God called me to bless all and to pray for the healing, liberation of others. This is what I do, my son. I said, put my hand on his shoulder. He cried and said, I ask you pardon. He bent down and touched my feet and kissed my feet. I went with him to his wife in the hospital to pray over. She's still alive. When I knew that, why he betrayed me, because she was a poor man. He had only a very small hut to live. Somebody promised money. He got the money and gave all the details about me. He did not think that I would be kidnapped. I went to his house, had a cup of black coffee with him. And I promised that I would make a house for him. Later, I begged rich people that got money and built a house for him. Yes, the Lord from the beginning of my Christian life, especially my charismatic life, tells me to forgive, forgive, forgive. And to do good to those who hate or those who hated or did harm to me. And this is the mercy we are to show to others. Often I ask myself, when I work with the people, how many Christians, how many Catholics really forgive others and show God's mercy? You know, we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 onwards. I just explained, I don't read because time is running short. When you bring something to the altar, if you remember somebody is having ill feeling towards you, leave your uh, gift there. Go reconcile and come back and give the offering. I ask myself, are we following that? Sometime back a priest came to me for a prayer of physical healing. 
And when he started speaking, I asked him, Father Jir, do you celebrate Holy Mass? He asked, why? You asked that question. I said, when I look at you, I see all the Holy Masses you celebrated are lying under the altar, not going up to heaven. He found strange. Uh, what are you speaking, Father James? Yes, then I caught at this. I said, you have deep seated hatred towards your own bishop. It is months you have talked with him. I say very clearly, you even think that he would die soon and go to hell. You know, the priest was simply melt. He was asking himself how I knew it. It's actually the Holy Spirit that revealed all this to me when I looked at him. He said, true father, true father. I could not accept the transfer he gave me. I insulted him. I calumniated him. And I spoke all bad about him to all others. I found hard to forgive. Then I said, you are celebrating March with that hatred in the heart. You know, Father, Bible very, very, very clearly says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 50, if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. You are a murderer, Father. You are not forgiven by God because you are not forgiven your bishop. All your holy masses are under the altar, not going up to heaven. If you received any mass stipend, I said that to return, give back. You know, in a way, he was a good priest. He was melt at those words. He went after some time, he came to me with a testimony, which you can read in my website, jayamanyakal at dot net. Uh, he came back fully healed in his body from asthma, psoriasis, headache, etc. He came and embraced me and said, Father, going from your room, I went to the bishop, felt prostrate and asked pardon. When I did that, the bishop stood up and said, Father, it is I who should ask you pardon. I sinned against you. Oh, both of them wept, asked pardon to each other. They celebrated a mass in the bishop's house. He said, with that, his healing began. I did not pray for his healing, no. Nobody prayed for his healing, but Jesus healed him by his grace because he forgave. This is a command of the Lord. I know many people make confession. I hate my father. I hate my father-in-law or mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. At the end of the confession, the priest give a small advice and give a, a small penance. Doing the penance, the penitent thinks that sins are forgiven and go to Holy Communion. I tell you very honestly, no priest can forgive sin. No man can forgive sin. It is God who forgives sins. The priest is sitting in the place of Jesus. That's why we call priest other Christ, other Christus. So with the authority given to him by Christ in the church, he's forgiving sin. God is forgiving. Jesus is forgiving. He knows the heart of a man or woman who is kneeling before uh, in the confession. Yes, if you are not forgiven, even the priest give absolution, I say your sins will not be forgiven. You must get reconciled and then go to confession or immediately after confession, go and get reconciled. If you offended, you must ask pardon. This is mercy. All of you wanted me to speak about mercy. I'm speaking about mercy. Yes, this is what you receive in the, in the life in the church. Yes, God forgives us. In all the sacraments we have, these two aspects of God's love, forgiveness and life. That is grace. We know in confession, our sins are forgiven, we receive grace to be a new person, to continue living in holiness. And we get grace not to commit sin. So many things happen. That is grace. We don't deserve. God is giving what we don't deserve. And the Holy Eucharist too. We don't deserve to eat the body and blood of Christ. Yes, but he gives and we eat and drink his body and blood. It is grace, not a forgiveness. So again, I define Yes, mercy is cancelling, withholding what we deserve. The 
the age of sin is death. We deserve death. But Jesus took it upon his cross and forgiven us. That is his mercy. He reconciled us. He redeemed us. Justified us. Made us holy on the cross. This is one side of God's love. We say God is love. Yes, then we have to have grace to continue living. And in every sacrament, we, get, we receive that. We know in the Old Testament, uh, people had the Ark of the Covenant in which a part of the manna was kept. The Aaron staff that flowered was kept. Also Ten Commandments. And on the top, there was what they call uh, the two cherubims and the mercy seat. The Israelites believe that God comes there and showers his mercy on the people for us. So, and we see as we go ahead, that mercy seat is the heart of Jesus. When we love the commandments and love him, and keep the commandments and love him, and keep the manna, the Holy Eucharist in our life, and then surely, surely, under the authority of the Pope, the staff of Aaron, remaining as a faithful Catholic, I say, from the mercy seat that is his heart, God's love would come. I'm sure many of you in your childhood might have asked your father or mother why Jesus died. I also used to ask. I'm sure you must have heard the story of Cardinal Topo of India, who was the president of the Bishop's Conference. He was a new Christian. Uh, when he was four or five only, the family became Christian, Catholic. And he asked his mother, why Jesus died on the cross? Mother said, because of our sin. He pointed the finger at the mother and the crucifixion said, if we commit to sin, we should die on the cross, not Jesus. I'm sure many of us thought that when we were children. Why the innocent lamb, Jesus died on the cross. We should have died for our sins. It is his love. Go so loud. It is there, the small boy, with all his emotion, decided and said to him, Mama, one day I want to become a priest and be like another Christ. Become another Christ and pray, work for sinners, to bring them to God's love, great mercy, Love, the, the ocean of love. Yes, I stop because uh, my time is over. Much more I can speak. God may give one the opportunity, I suppose. Now, I wind up this with a small prayer for you. I know you'll have adoration soon. And may God bless you all. I wish all of you the happy feast of the, um, uh, the divine mercy. Also the forthcoming Pentecost, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, thank you and praise you for allowing me to share something about God's love as mercy and grace. If they received anything in their heart, if any word touched them, I pray that it work honestly in the heart to the Holy Spirit, especially in the area of showing mercy to others by forgiving. How many sins we have committed you have forgiven, not really forgiven, forgotten. Oh, great. In a spectacular way, we experience your mercy on the cross. We are receiving what we don't, what we, you are taking away what we deserve, that punishment, hell. Pastor Jesus, thank you. And you are giving us what we don't deserve, life eternal. Jesus, I present everybody to the throne of grace that is your heart, which is broken. Not only 2020 years ago on Calvary, but every day at the altar, when the priest break the body and put a part of it in the blood, in the chalice. A time where the bread and wine were transubstantiated into his body and blood. A big sacrifice is done. That's the time you are showing mercy to us, Lord. That's the time you are giving life to us. Give us grace uh, to be like you. That's what you expect us, Lord. I pray for the same grace for all the listeners. They may 
come and dip themselves in the ocean of God's mercy and wash themselves, cleanse themselves, purify themselves, heal themselves, and then be filled with the great life and possess Jesus. Yes, possessing Jesus is eternal life. We read in 1 John chapter 5, 11 and 12, eternal life is in Christ Jesus. He who possesses Jesus possesses eternal life. Help each one to possess that eternal life. And do as you are done to others, Lord. Give that grace of real love. At the last judgment, you will be judging, looking on both sides. Because you are done, showed mercy to others, you shall inherit paradise, eternal life. And to the left, you will say, because you are not done this, you are not shown charity to others, you shall be condemned. You shall go to eternal fire. Oh, my Jesus, yes, all throughout your life, you want us to live your life and to be like you. We must be another Christ. That is our vocation. We understand that from Romans chapter 8, verse 29, we are called to be like his son. Yes, help us to be like Jesus, the merciful Father who is so shown in the life of Jesus. Father, we want to be true, your children, your true children. Right now, bless, sanctify these people, liberate these people, heal these people, fill them with your mercy, fill them with your grace, so that every day, at every moment, they experience your love, your love, and give that love to others. Love as you loved us, even giving the last drop of the blood, fullness of life. Yes, Lord, life is in blood. Yes, you are. shed your blood. It was giving of life. Jesus, help us. Should shed blood for others, give ourselves to others and live. Jesus, a life of love. Heal our selfishness, our pride, and egoism, everything. Help us to die to ourselves, take up the cross, and follow you, and to be like Christ. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask, to be like He, not in a measure, but in His fullness. All I ask to be like you, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask to be like you, all through life journey, from earth to glory. All I ask. To be like him. Mm -hmm. I bring all of you to the merciful heart of Jesus. Bless you, each one in your family, your family and family life. And bless your prayer group. Bless all your near and dear ones. Bless the country where you are. Bless the church where you are. Heal you, liberate you sanctify you, joining my prayers with the prayers of all the priests in heaven and on earth, with the prayers of all the saints in heaven, especially Mary and Joseph. I bless you, sanctify you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.